from the 1961 November issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Hybrid by Keith Lummer. Deep in the soil of the planet, rootlets tougher than steel wire probed among glassy sand grains through packed veins of clay and layers of flimsy slate, sensing and discarding inert elements, seeking out calcium, iron, nitrogen. Deeper still, a secondary system of roots clutched the massive face of the bedrock. Sensitive tendrils monitored the minute trembling in the planetary crust, the rhythmic tidal pressures, the seasonal weight of ice, the footfalls of the wild creatures that hunted in the mile-wide shadow of the giant yanda tree. On the surface far above, the immense trunk, massive as a cliff, its vast girth anchored by mighty buttresses, reared up 900 yards above the prominence, spreading huge limbs in the white sunlight. The tree was only remotely aware of the movement of air over the polished surfaces of innumerable leaves, the tingling exchange of molecules of water, carbon dioxide, oxygen. Automatically, it reacted to the faint pressures of the wind, sensing slender, tensing slender twigs to hold each leaf at a constant angle to the radiation that struck down through the foliage complex. The long day wore on. Air flowed in intricate patterns. Radiation waxed and waned with the drift of vapor masses in the stratosphere, in the substratosphere. Nutrient molecules moved along capillaries. The rocks groaned gently in the dark under the shaded slopes. In the invulnerability of its titanic mass, the tree dozed in a state of generalized low-level consciousness. The sun moved westward. Its light, filtered through an increasing depth of atmosphere, was an ominous yellow now. Sinewy twigs rotated following the source of energy. Somnolently, the tree retra somnolently, somnolently, the tree retracted tender buds against the increasing cold, adjusted its rate of heat and moisture loss, its receptivity to radiation. As it slept, it dreamed of the long past, the years of free wandering in the faunal stage before the instinct to root and grow had driven it here. It remembered the grove of its youth, the patriarchal tree, the Spore brothers. It was dark now. The wind was rising. A powerful gust pressed against the ponderous obstacle of the tree. Grand thews of major branches creaked, resisting. Chilled leaves curled tight against the smooth bark. Deep underground, fibers hugged rock, transmitting data which were correlated with impressions from distant leaf surfaces. There were ominous vibrations from the northeast. Relative humidity was rising, air pressure falling, a pattern formed, signaling danger. The tree stirred, a tremor ran through the mighty branch system, shattering fragile frost crystals that had begun to form on shaded surfaces. Alertness stirred in the heart brain, dissipating the euphoric dream pattern, disappearing, ugh, dissipating the euphoric dream pattern. Reluctantly, long dormant faculties came into play. The tree awoke. Instantly, it assessed the situation. A storm was moving in off the sea, a major typhoon. It was too late for effective measures. Ignoring the pain of unaccustomed activity, the tree sent out new shock roots, cables three inches in diameter, strong as stranded steel, to grip the upreared rock slabs a hundred yards north of the taproot. There was nothing more that tree, the tree could do. Impassively, it awaited the onslaught of the storm. That's a storm down there, Malpri said. Don't worry, we'll miss it. Galt fingered controls, eyes on dial faces. Pull up and make a new approach, Malpri said, craning his neck from his acceleration cradle. Shut up, I'm running this tub. Shut up, I'm running this tub. Locked in with two nuts, Malpri said. You and the creep. Me and the creep are getting tired of listening to you, bitch, Mal. When we land, Malpri... I'll meet you outside, Pantel said. I told you I don't like the name Creep. What, again? Galt said. You all healed up from the last time? Not quite. I don't seem to heal very well in space. Permission denied, Pantel, Galt said. He's too big for you. Mal, leave him alone. I'll leave him alone, Mal pre-muttered. I ought to dig a hole and leave him in it. Save your energy for down there, Galt said. If we don't make a strike on this one, we've had it. Captain, may I go along on the field reconnaissance? My training in biology. You better stay with the ship, Pantel, and don't tinker. Just wait for us. We haven't got the strength to carry you back. That was an accident, Captain, and the time before. Skip it, Pantel. You mean well, but you've got two left feet and ten thumbs. 
I've been working on improving my coordination, Captain. I've been reading. The ship buffeted sharply as guidance vanes bit into atmosphere. Pan yelped. Uh-oh, he called. I'm afraid I've opened up that left elbow again. Don't bleed on me, you clumsy slob, Malpri said. Quiet, Galt said between his teeth. I'm busy. Pantel fumbled a handkerchief in place over the cud. He would have had he would have to practice those relaxing exercises he had read about, and he would definitely start in weightlifting soon and watching his diet. And he would be very careful this time and land at least one good one on Galt just as soon as they landed. Even before the first outward signs of damage appeared, the tree knew that it had lost the battle against the typhoon. In the lull as the eye of the storm passed over, it assessed the damage. There was no response from the northeast quadrant of the sensory network where rootlets had been torn from the rock face, the taproot itself seated now against pulverized stone. While the almost indestructible fiber of the Yanda tree had held firm, the granite had failed. The tree was doomed by its own mass. Now, mercilessly, the storm struck again, thundering out of the southwest to assault the tree with blind ferocity. Shot cables snapped like gossamer. Great slabs of rock groaned and parted, with detonations lost in the howl of the wind. In the trunk, pressures built, agonizingly. Four hundred yards south of the taproot, a crack opened in the sodden slope, gaping wider. Wind-driven water poured in, softening the soil, loosening the grip of a million tiny rootlets. Now the major roots shifted, slipping. Far above, the majestic crown of the Yonda tree yielded imperceptibly to the irresistible torrent of air. The giant north buttress, forced against the underlying stone, shrieked as tortured cells collapsed, then burst with a shattering roar, audible even to the storm. A great arc of earth to the south, lifted by exposed roots, opened a gaping cavern. Now the storm moved on, thundered down the slope, trailing its retinue of tattered debris and driving rain. The last vengeful gust whipped branches in a final frenzy. Then the victor was gone. And on the devastating David prom and on the devastated promontory, the stupendous mass of ancient tree leaned with the resistless inertia of colliding moons to the accompaniment of a cannonade of parting sinews falling with dreamlike grace. And in the heart brain of the tree, consciousness faded in the unendurable pain of destruction. Pantel climbed down from the open port, leaned against the ship to catch his breath. He was feeling weaker than he expected. Tough luck being on short rations. This would set him back on getting started on his weightlifting program. And he didn't feel ready to take on Malpri yet. But just as soon as he had some fresh food and fresh air, these are safe to eat, Galt, Galt called, wiping the analyzer needle on his pants leg and thrusting it back into his hip pocket. He tossed two large red fruits to Pantel. When you get through eating, Pantel, you better get some water and swab down the inside. Malpri and I will take a look around. The two moved off. Pantel sat on the springy grass and bit into the apple-sized sphere. The texture, he thought, was reminiscent of avocado. The skin was tough and aromatic, possibly a natural cellulose acetate. There seemed to be no seeds. That being the case, the thing was not properly a fruit at all. It would be interesting to study the flora of this planet. As soon as he reached home, he would have to enroll in a course in E.T. botany. Possibly he would go to Heidelberg or Uppsala, attend live lectures by eminent scholars, he would have a cozy little apartment, two rooms would do, in the old part of town. In the evening, he would have friends in for discussions over a bottle of wine. However, this wasn't getting the job done. There was a glimpse of water across the slope. Pantel finished his meal, gathered his buckets, and set out. Why do we want to wear ourselves out? Malpri said. We need the exercise. It'll be four months before we get another chance. What are we, tourists? We got to see the sights? Malpri stopped leaned against a, a boulder, panting. He stared upward at the crater and the pattern of uprilted, uptilted roots and beyond at the forest-like spread of the branches of the fallen tree. Makes our sequoias look like dandelions, Galt said. It must have been the storm, the one we dodged coming in. So what? A thing that big, it kind of does something to you. Any money in it? Malpri sneered. Galt looked at him sourly. Yeah, you got a point there. Let's go. I don't like leaving the creep back there with the ship. Galt looked at Malpri. Why don't you lay off the kid? I don't like loonies. Don't kid me, Malpri. Pantel is highly intelligent, in his own way. Maybe that's what you can't forgive. Gives me the creeps. He's a nice-looking kid. He means well. Yeah, Malpri said. Maybe he means well. But it's not enough. From the, delirium of conscious, from the delirium of concussion, consciousness returned slowly to the tree. Random signals penetrated the background clatter of 
shadowy impulses from maimed senses. Air pressure zero, falling. Air pressure 112, rising. Air pressure negative. Major tremor radiating from, major tremor radiating from temperature 171 degrees, temperature negative 40 degrees, temperature 26 degrees. Intense radiation in the blue only, red only, ultraviolet. Relative humidity infinite, wind from north northeast, velocity infinite, wind rising vertically, velocity infinite, wind from east west. Decisively, the tree blanked off the yammering nerve trunks, narrowing its attention to the immediate status concept. A brief assessment sufficed to reveal the extent of its ruin. There was no reason it saw to seek extended personal survival. However, certain immediate measures were necessary to gain time for emergency spore propagation. At once, the tree mind triggered the survival syndrome. Capillaries spasmed, forcing vital juices to the brain. Synaptic helices dilated, heightening neural conductivity. Cautiously, awareness was extended to the system of major fibers, then to the individual filaments and interweaving capillaries. Here there was a turbulence of air molecules colliding with ruptured tissues, the wave pattern of light impinging on exposed surfaces. Microscopic filaments contracted cutting off fluid loss through the wounds. Now the tree mind fine-tuned its concentration, scanning the infinitely patterned cell matrix. Here amid confusion, there was order in the incessant restless movement of particles, the flow of fluids, the convoluted intricacy of the alpha spiral. Delicately, the tree mind adjusted the function mosaic in preparation for spore generation. Malpris stopped, shaded his eyes. A tall, thin figure stood in the shape of the uptilted up root mass on the ridge. Looks like we headed back at the right time, Malpri said. Damn, Galt said. He hurried forward. Pantel came to meet him. I told you to stay with the ship, Pantel. I finished my job, Captain. You didn't say. Okay, okay. Is anything wrong? No, sir, but I've just remembered something. Later, Pantel. Let's get back to the ship. We've got work to do. Captain, you do you know what this is? Pantel gestured toward the gigantic fallen tree. Sure, it's a tree, he turned to Galt. Let's... Yes, but what kind? Beats me, I'm no botanist. Captain, this is a rare species. In fact, it's supposed to be extinct. Have you ever heard of the Yanda? No. Yes. Galt looked at Pantel. Is that what this is? I'm sure of it. Captain, this is a very valuable find. You mean it's worth money? Malpri was looking at Galt. I don't know. What's the story, Pantel? An intelligent race with an early animal phase. Later, they root, becoming fixed, functioning as a plant. Nature's way of achieving the active competition necessary for natural selection, then the advantage of conscious selection of a rooting site. How do we make money on it? Pantel looked at the looming wall of the fallen trunk, curving away from the jumble of shattered branches a hundred feet, two hundred more in diameter. <clears throat> the bark was smooth, almost black. The foot, foot wide leaves were glossy, varicolored. This great tree. Malpri stopped, picked up a fragment from a burst root. This great club, he said, to knock your lousy brains out with. Shut up, Mal. It lived, roamed the planet perhaps 10,000 years ago in the young faunal stage. Then instinct drove it here to fulfill the cycle of nature. Picture this ancient champion looking for the first time out across the valley, saying his farewells as metamorphosis begins. Nuts, Malpri said. This was the fate of all males of his kind who lived too long, to stand forever on some height of land, to remember through unending ages the brief glory of youth, himself his own heroic monument. Where do you get all that crud? Malpri said. Here was the place, Pantel said. Here all his journeys ended. Okay, Pantel. Very moving. He said something about this being valuable. Captain... This tree is still alive, for a while at least. Even after the heart is dead, the appearance of life will persevere. A mantle of new shoots will leaf out to to shut. <sighs> a mantle of new shoots will leaf out to shroud the cadaver. Tiny atavistic plantlets, without connection to the brain, parasitic to the corpse, identical to the ancestral stock from which the giant sprang, symbolizing the extinction of a hundred million years of evolution. Get to the point. You could take cuttings from the heart of the tree. I'd have a book. It gives details on the anatomy. We can keep the tissues alive. Back in civilization, we can regenerate the tree, brain and all. It will take time. Suppose we sell the cuttings. Yes, any university would pay well. How long would it take? Not long. We can cut in with natural aperture. We can cut in with narrow aperture blasters. Okay, get your books, Pantel. We'll give it a try. Apparently, the Yanda mind observed. Apparently, the Yanda mind observed. 
A very long time had elapsed since spore propagation had last been stimulated by the proximity of a female. Withdrawn into introverted dreams, the tree had taken no conscious notice as the whispering contact with the spore brothers faded and the host creatures dwindled away. Now, edictically, the stored impression sprang into clarity. It was apparent that no female would pass this way again. The yonder kind was gone. The fever of instinct that motivated the elaboration of the mechanisms of emergency propagation had burned itself out futilely. The new pattern of stalked oculi lay... The new pattern of stalked oculi gazed unfocused at an empty vista of gnarled jungle growth. The myriad filaments of the transfer nexus coiled quiescent. The ranked grasping members that would have brought a host creature near drooped unused. The dran sacs brimmed needlessly. No further action was indicated. Now death would come in due course. Somewhere a drumming began. A gross tremor sensed through the dead hush. It ceased. Began again. Went on and on. It was of no importance, but a faint curiosity led the tree to extend a sensory filament, tap the abandoned nerve trunk. Convulsively, the tree mind recoiled, severing the contact, an impressuring of smoldering destruction, impossible thermal activity. Disoriented, the tree mind considered the implications of the searing pain. A freak of damage in sense organs? A phantom impulse from destroyed nerves? No, the impact had been traumatic, but the data were there. The tree mind re-examined each synaptic vibration, reconstructing the experience. In a moment, the meaning was clear. A fire was cutting deep into the body of the tree. Working hastily, the tree assembled a barrier of incombustible mo molecules in the path of the fire, waited. The heat reached the barrier, hesitated, and the barrier flashed into incandescence. A thicker wall was necessary. The tree applied all of its waning vitality to the task. The shield grew, matched the pace of the fire, curved out to intercept, and wavered, halted. The energy demand was too great. Starved muscular conduits cramped. Blackness closed over the, dis blackness closed over the disintegrating consciousness. Sluggishly, clarity returned. Now the fire would advance unchecked. Soon it would bypass the aborted defensives, advance to consume the heart brain itself. There was no other countermeasure remaining. It was unfortunate since propagation had not been consummated, but unavoidable. Calmly, the tree awaited its destruction by fire. Pantel put the blaster down, sat on the grass, and wiped Tari's soot from his face. What killed him off? Malpri asked suddenly. Pantel looked at him. Spoilers, he said. What's that? They killed them to get the drawn. They covered up by pretending the Yonda were a menace, but it was the drawn they were after. Don't you ever talk plain? Malpri, did I ever tell you I didn't like you? Malpri spat. What's with this drawn? The Yanda have a very strange reproductive cycle. In an emergency, the spores released by the male tree can be implanted in almost any warm-blooded creature and carried in the body for an indefinite length of time. When the host animal mates, the dormant spores come into play. The offspring appears perfectly normal. In fact, the spore steps in and corrects any defects in the individual repairs injuries, fights disease, and so on, and the lifespan is extended, but eventually the creature goes through the metamorphosis, roots, and becomes a regular male yonda tree instead of dying of old age. You talk too much. What's this drawn? The tree releases a hypnotic gas to attract host animals. In concentrated form, it's a potent narcotic. That's drawn. They killed the trees to get it. The excuse was that the yonda could make humans give birth to monsters. That was nonsense. But it's sold in the black market for fabulous amounts. How do you get the drawn? Pantel looked at Malpri. Why do you want to know? Malpri looked at the book which lay on the grass. It's in that, ain't it? Never mind that. Galt's orders were to help me get the heart treadings. He didn't know about the drawn. Taking the drawn will kill the specimen. You can't. Malpri stepped toward the book. Pantel jumped toward him, swung a haymaker, missed. Malpri knocked him spinning. Don't touch me, creep. Wiped his fist on his pants leg. Pantel lay stunned. Pantel. That's misspelled right there. <clears throat> Interesting. Pantel lay stunned. Malpri thumbed the book, found what he wanted. After ten minutes, he dropped the book and picked up the blaster and moved off. Malpri cursed the heat, wiping at his face. A many-legged insect scuttled away before him. Underfoot, something furtive rustled. One good thing, no animals with this damned woods bigger than a mouse. No animals in this dimmed woods bigger than a mouse. A hell of a place. 
You'd have to st watch his step. It wouldn't do to get lost in here. The velvety wall of the half-buried trunk loomed as dense growth gave way suddenly to a clear stretch. Malpre stopped, breathing hard. He got out his sudden handkerchief, staring up at the blank wall. A ring of dead white stalks sprouted from the dead tree. Nearby were other growths, like snarls of wiry black seaweed and ropey-looking things, dangling. Malpre backed away, snarling. Some crawling disease, some kind of filthy fungus, but... Malpre stopped. Maybe this was what he was looking for. Sure, this was what those pictures in the book showed. This was where the drawn was. They didn't know it would look like some creeping... Stop, Malpre! Malpre whirled. Don't be too... stupid... Pantel was gasping for breath. There was a bruise on his jaw. Let me rest. Talk to you. Die, you gutter scraping. Have a nice long rest, but don't muck with me. Malpre turned his back on Pantel, unlimbered the blaster. Pantel grabbed up a broken limb and slammed it across Malpre's head. The rotten wood snapped. Malpre staggered and recovered. He turned, his face livid. A trickle of blood ran down. All right, creep, he grated. Pantel came to him, swung a whistling right, arm bent upwardly. Malpre lunged, and Pantel's elbow caught him across the jaw. His eyes went glassy. He sagged, fell to his hands and knees. Pantel laughed aloud. Malpre shook his head, breathing hoarsely, got to his feet. Pantel took aim and hit him solidly on the jaw. The blow seemed to clear Malpre's head. He slapped a second punch aside, knocked Pantel full length with a backhanded blow. He dragged Pantel to his feet, swung a hard left and right. Pantel bounced and lay still. Malpre stood over him, rubbing his jaw. He stirred Pantel with his foot. Maybe the creep was dead. Laying his creeping hands on Malpre. Galt wouldn't like it, but the creep had started it. Sneaked up and hit him from behind. He had the mark to prove it. Anyway, the news about the Dran would cheer Galt up. Better go get Galt up here. Then he could cut the Dran out and get, this, get away from this creeping planet. Let the creep bleed. Malpre turned back toward the ship, leaving Pantel huddled beside the fallen tree. The Yonda craned external oculi to study the fallen creature, which had now apparently entered a dormant phase. A red, ex a red exudation oozed from orifices at, the orifices at the upper end, and from what appeared to be breaks in the epidermis. It was a strange creature, bearing some superficial resemblance to the familiar host creatures. Its antics and those of the other were curious indeed. Perhaps they were male and female, and the encounter had been a mating. Possibly this hibernation was normal process, preparatory to rooting. If only it were not so alien, it might serve as a carrier. The surface of the organism heaved, a limb twitched. Apparently it was on the verge of reviving. Soon it would scurry away and be seen no more. It could be wise to make a, qu it it could be wise to make a quick examination if the creature should prove suitable as a host. Quickly the tree elaborated a complex of tiny filaments, touched the still figure tentatively, then penetrated the surprisingly soft surface layer seeking out nerve fibers. A trickle of impressions flowed in, indecipherable. The tree put forth a major sensory tendal, tendril, divided and subdivided it into fibers only a few atoms in diameter, fanned them out through the unconscious man, tracing the spinal column, entering the brain. Here was a wonder of complexity, an unthinkable profusion of connections. This was a center capable of the highest intellectual functions, unheard of in a host creature. Curiously, the tree mind probed deeper, attuning itself, scanning through a kaleidoscope of impressions, buried memories, gaudy symbolisms. Never had the Yonda mind encountered the hyperintellectual processes of emotion. It pressed on deeper into the phantasma phantasmagoria of dreams, color, laughter, and clash of, clash of arms, banners rippling in the sun, chords of a remote music, and night-blooming flowers, abstractions of incredible beauty mingled with vivid conceptualizations of glory, Fascinated, the tree mind explored Pantel's secret romantic dreams of fulfillment and abruptly encountered the alien mind. There was a moment of utter stillness as the two minds assessed each other. You are dying, the alien mind spoke. Yes, and you are trapped in a sickly host creature. Why did you not select a stronger host? I originated here. I, we are one. Why do you not strengthen this host? How? The Yonda mind paused. You occupy only a corner of the brain. You do not use your powers? I am a segment. The alien mind paused, confused. I am conceptualized by the monitor mind as the subconscious. What is the monitor mind? It is the totality of the personality. It is above the conscious, directing. This is a grain of great power. 
is the brain of great power, yet great masses of cells are unused. Why are major trunks aborted as they are? I do not know. There was no more information from the alien brain, which indeed housed multiple minds. The Yonda mind broke contact, tuned. There was a blast of mind force overwhelming. The Yonda mind reeled, groped for orientation. You are not one of my minds. You are the monitor mind? gasped the Yonda. Yes, what are you? The Yonda mind projected its self-concept. Strange, very strange. You have useful skills, I perceive. Teach them to me. The Yonda mind squirmed under the torrent of thought impulses. Reduce your volume. You will destroy me. I will try. Teach me that trick of manipulating molecules. The Yonda cringed under the booming of the alien mind. What an instrument! A fantastic anomaly, a mind such as this linked to this fragile host creature, and unable even to use its powers. But it would be a matter of the greatest simplicity to make the necessary corrections, rebuild and toughen the host, eliminate the defects. Teach me, Yonda mind! Alien, I die soon, but I will teach you. There is, however, a condition. The two minds conferred and reached agreement. At once, the Yonda mind initiated sweeping rearrangements at the submolecular level. First, cell regeneration, stitching up the open lesions on arm and head. Antibodies were modified in vast numbers, flushed through the system. Parasites died. Maintain this process, the tree directed. Now the muscular layers, surely they were inadequate. The very structure of the cells was flimsy. The Yonda devised the necessary improvements, tapped the pulp of its cast-off body for materials, reinforced the musculature. Now for the skeletal members. The tree visualized the articulation of the ambulatory mechanism, consulted for a moment the substitution of a more practical tentacular concept. There was little time. Better to retain the stony bodies, merely strengthen them, using metallo-vegetable fibers. The air sacs, too, and the heart, they would have lasted no time at all as they were. Observe, alien, thus and thus. I see. It is a clever trick. The Yonda worked over the body of Pantel, adjusting, correcting, reinforcing, discarding a useless appendix or tonsil here, adding a reserve air storage unit there. A vestigial eye deep in the brain was refurbished for sensitivity at the radio frequencies, linked with controls. The spine was deftly fused at the base. Additional, mis additional mesenteries were added for intestinal support. Following the basic pattern laid down in the genes, the tree mind rebuilt the body. When the process was finished and the alien mind has, had absorbed the techniques demonstrated, the Yonda mind paused. It is finished. I am ready to reestablish the conscious mind in overt control. Remember your promise. I will remember. The Yonda mind began its withdrawal. Troublesome instinct was served. Now it could rest until the end. Wait, I've got a better idea, Yonda. Two weeks down and 14 to go, Galt said. Why don't you break down and tell me what happened back there? How's Malpri? Pantel asked. He's all right. Broken bones knit. And you only broke a few. The book was wrong about the Yonda spores, Pantel said. They don't have the power in themselves to reconstruct the host creature. But what? The infected animal, the health and lifespan of the host is improved. But the improvement is made by the tree at the time of propagation to ensure a good chance for the spores. You mean you? We made a deal. Yonda gave me this. Pantel pressed a thumb against the steel bulkhead. The metal yielded. And a few other tricks. In return, I'm host to the Yonda spores. Galt moved away. Doesn't that bother you? Parasites. It's an equitable deal. The spores are microscopic and completely dormant until the proper conditions develop. Yeah, but you said yourself this vegetable brain has worked, has worked on your mind. It merely erased all the scars of traumatic experience, corrected deficiencies, taught me how to use what I have. How about teaching me? Sorry, Galt. Pantel shook his head. Impossible. Galt considered Pantel's remarks. What about these proper conditions for the spores? He asked suddenly. You wake up and find yourself sprouting some morning? Well, Pentel coughed. That's where my part of the deal comes in. A host creature transmits the spores through the normal mating process. The offspring gets a good health and long life before the metamorphosis. That's not so bad to live a hundred years. 
and then pick a nice spot to root and grow and watch the seasons turn? Galt considered. Man does get tired, he said. I know a spot where you can look for miles out across the Pacific. So I've promised to be very active, Pantel said. It will take a lot of my time, but I intend to discharge my obligation to the fullest. Did you hear that, Yonda? Pantel asked silently. I did, came the reply from the unused corner he had assigned to the Yonda ego pattern. Our next thousand years should be very interesting. Well, that's an interesting story. It's my first time reading it, so I'm kind of taking in the impact of that at the end. Um, I was pretty sure that Pantel was going to be the protagonist and maybe he'd have some sort of transformation, but I wasn't expecting it to just like go there that fast. I know Keith Lemmer likes to, to play with these types of concepts, these different mind-building concepts, and he was definitely a huge reader of psychology, knew a lot of hypnosis stuff. Um, but wow. Just give me a little uh, moment to react. So it looks like that takes about 30 minutes to read. And that's not too bad. I can do that in one sitting. I didn't even really have to pause, so that's great. Also, it reads reads out loud very well. I think Keith Lamer um, is a really good writer in that his prose is very enjoyable to read, but it doesn't get you bogged down in trying to figure out what it is. It's like, um, I don't know. He takes the telepathy approach to writing in that he's just trying to tell, he's trying to give you as much of an impression of what's going on in the scene as possible so that you can imagine what he's imagining. And um, like, you know, kind of giving you a report on the subject. And I like that he gives these insights into people's emotions. It was a little confusing at first to keep track of which one was Pantel and which one, was Galt and which one was Malpre at first. I'm going to try to develop a unique voice for each one uh, as I do the reading, so it'll be a little easier to keep track of that. And then imagery-wise, uh, obviously there's going to be some tree imagery. Um, well, we'll see what happens. Um, I wonder if I'll try illustrating this. I usually use stock photos. I could still use stock to illustrate it, though. So it, it's, I don't think it would be too difficult to illustrate this. And I think it would be a pretty interesting take on the story to actually add that. So um, those are my thoughts. Um, you'll probably see this one within a week or two. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm not going to read through it again right now. I have like kind of a headache. We've had like the weather shifting a lot. So, um, but that, that was enough of a take to get an idea of what I'm in for whenever I read them in the future. So uh, look forward to this audiobook um, in a cleaner reading with um, illustrations of some sort in a video on the channel soon. And um, if you watch this, thanks for watching. Ciao.